good evening and welcome to all the students i am dr vikash sahu and along with me dr gorav kulkarni both of us will be conducting this session this is going to be an interactive session uh, based on uh, inotropes and vasoactive medicines which we are regularly using in our practice for both cardiac anesthesia as well as post operative cardiac surgical intensive care also initially there will be a, a brief introduction on receptors regulating cardiac function now this can you all see my screen yes sir yeah. yes sir so we will be conducting this session based on the contents of this session would be first dr gaurav kulkarni will present his talk on receptors regulating cardiac function and then we will go ahead uh, with uh, a brief discussion, uh, discussion on the regularly used vasoactive medications in our practice we will start off by defining a few terms going through a few definitions discussing a few basic physiological principles which will help us in uh, guiding our therapy we will discuss in brief the drug classification and then the most common vasoactive agents which we use as anesthetists as well as post operative intensivists we will have a brief uh, outline I'm about some of the new we will have a brief uh, summary of some of the newer agents which are in uh, being investigated in clinical practice and then we'll go over to some uh, interesting case scenarios which we may face regularly in our practice so over to dr gorav kulkarni gorav please start your presentation on receptors yes sir is my screen visible hello no no not as yet no no not visible now yes yes, yes. so good evening everybody today my topic of presentation is receptor controlling the cardiac functioning so what are the receptors receptors are the membrane proteins that transduce the signal from outside to the inside of the cell how they get activated when a ligand or a hormone carried in a blood or a neurotransmitter released from a nerve ending or a local messenger released from neighboring cell binds to the receptor it gets activated so what it does it induces a conformational change in the receptor molecule this process changes then the configuration of the intracellular segment of the receptor and results in activation of intracellular system with various potential effect ranging from enhanced phosphorylation and changes in intracellular that is second messenger concentration to activation of some ion channels so what are the receptor classes broadly receptors are classified into two major classes one is the protein tyrosine kinase receptor second is the g protein coupled receptors so g protein coupled receptor these are abundant and, uh, and in our uh, cardiac anesthesia uh, we are daily dealing with these receptors through the drugs so g protein uh, uh, g protein coupled receptors all belong to one super family beta adrenergic these are beta adrenergic receptors alpha adrenergic receptors muscarinic acetylcholine receptors adenosine a1 receptors adenosine triphosphate receptors histamine that h2 receptors vasoactive intestinal peptide receptors and angiotensin 2 receptors Uh, among these beta adrenergic receptors and muscarinic acetylcholine receptors we are going to discuss which uh, play a major role in co controlling the cardiovascular system so what is the structure of g protein coupled receptors these receptors have similar molecular characteristics they are generally several hundred to thousand amino acids in length and contain seven stretches of 20 to 25 hydrophobic amino acids so it is a, a family is referred to as seven transmembrane family the seven transmembrane domains are believed to be arranged in a funnel like structure the inside of which form the ligand binding domain the intracellular domains particularly the third intracellular loop and the c terminus bind to the g protein so uh, the g protein part is intracellularly and g protein re uh, receptors are on surface of the uh, cells so uh, g proteins are nothing but the gtp binding proteins at resting state they bind to the molecule known as gdp and when they are activated uh, by g protein coupled receptors or by intracellular messenger this gdp exchange for the gtp molecule so in this diagram we can see that uh, 
the g protein coupled receptors are pre present over the plasma membrane and they bring the uh, they bring the conformational change inside these g proteins which are nothing but consist of g alpha g beta and g gamma so g alpha unit is the one moiety and g beta gamma combined is the second uh, moiety so once they get activated by the agonist or ligand thus uh, g alpha and gtp gets detached and g beta gamma uh, uh, detaches and this then gtp g alpha brings about the uh, certain changes uh, uh, through the second messengers so g protein crosses depending upon what the uh, g alpha moiety does they are either stimulatory inhibitory that is stimulatory gs that activates the adenylate cyclase gi that inhibits the adenylate cyclase gq activates the phospholipase c <clears throat> the g proteins are attached to the inner surface of the cell membrane and get their name because of their interaction with gdp and gtp so what they do the this effect lead to increase intracellular calcium the alpha 1 receptors uh, act by this uh, by activating the gq uh, by inhibiting the adenylate cyclase alpha 2 receptors do and uh, they cause the inhibitory changes which we see and the beta receptors are the stimulatory gs they stimulate the adenylate cyclase and increase the cyclic amp so adrenergic receptors and signaling pathways main control over the cardiac contractility is for provided by the beta adrenergic signaling pathway which can be activated by circulating catecholamines which are derived from adrenal glands like adrenaline and noradrenaline or those released locally from adrenergic nerve endings on the myocardium the two main subtypes of beta receptors are beta 1 and beta 2 beta 3 is also exist but its main role is in lipolysis Uh, so uh, to concern uh, we ha we have only uh, two receptors which are beta 1 and beta 2 which are present in the heart and both both uh, contribute to the increased contractility induced by catecholamine stimulation the, this is different situation in vascular muscle where beta 2 adrenergic stimulation causes relaxation under normal condition the ratio of beta 1 as to beta 2 receptor in heart is approximately 70 as to 30 but in uh, later session we will discuss how it changes during the cardiac disease so the beta adrenergic receptors are closely related structurally as well as functionally so beta re uh, receptors mechanism of action they both are gs proteins uh, these are uh, receptors coupled to the gs proteins they activate the adrenal cyclase and thus leading to increase intracellular cyclic amp some differences in their intracellular signal are likely however for example investigator have suggested that beta 2 receptor couple more uh, effectively than beta 1 receptors and induce greater changes in cyclic amp levels the inotropy and electrophysiologic effects of beta signaling are indirect release uh, are the indirect <coughs> effects of increase intracellular cyclic amp levels cyclic amp activates a specific protein kinase that in turn is able to phosphorylate several important cardiac ion channels these are l type calcium channels sodium channels and voltage dependent potassium channels so phosphorylation alters the channel functioning and the resulting changes in membrane electrophysiology modify the myocardial behavior uh, now we come to the alpha adrenergic receptors the alpha adrenergic receptors like beta receptors uh, can be divided into two groups alpha 1 and alpha 2 both groups consist of several closely related subtypes with different tissue distribution and function and they are here as yet not fully differentiated alpha 1 receptors couple the gq proteins and thereby activate plc a process that results in increasing intracellular cal calcium concentration while the alpha 2 receptors couple to the gi proteins which inhibit the adenylate cyclase and consequently reduce the intracellular cyclic amp concentrations the primary role of alpha receptors is in the vasculature alpha 1 receptors are uh, present in muscular smooth muscle and they are main mediators of neurally mediated mediated vasoconstriction while the alpha 2 receptors on the neuron themselves function in a negative feedback loop to control alpha adrenergic vasoconstriction so alpha 2 receptor stimulation causes the opposite effects that seen by alpha 1 stimulation in the heart the primary subtype is alpha 1 and activation of these receptors uh, lead to modest increase in cardiac contractility now how the beta receptors are regulated beta receptor stimulation allows the dramatic increase in cardiac output which the human heart is capable but this beta receptor effect is clearly intended to be a temporary measure prolonged adrenergic stimulation has sig significant detrimental effects on myocardium with pronounced increase in cyclic amp levels leading to increase intracellular calcium concentration reduce rna and protein synthesis and subsequently the cell death <clears throat> 
thus beta receptor modulation is best viewed as a part of fight or flight response beneficial in short term but detri detrimental if dependent on for too long cardiac failure in particular has been shown to be associated with prolonged increase in adrenal stimulation even to the extent that norepinephrine spillover from cardiac nerve ending can be detected in the blood of patient in heart failure for this reason regulation of beta receptor functioning has received significant attention and in investigator now know that several mechanisms are capable of modifying these adrenergic responses of the myocyte but un unfortunately it appears that reduction of alpha uh, reduction of adrenergic responsiveness necessary to prevent cell death in presence of adrenergic overstimulation may be in large part responsible for decreased myocardial uh, performance which is hallmark of uh, ccf that is uh, cardiac failure Uh, one mechanism for decreasing beta receptor functioning is the down regulation of receptor that is decrease in density of the receptor in cardiac failure receptor levels are reduced up to 50% beta 1 receptors are down regulate more than beta 2 receptors thus resulting in change of b1 as to b2 ratio uh, which in the healthy heart is 70 as to 30 now in the failing heart this ratio approximates 3 as to 2 uh, there are various mechanism molecular mechanism which exist for the down regulation of beta receptors in long term beta 1 receptors are degraded and permanently removed from the myocyte cell surface in short term these can be temporarily removed from the cell membrane and stored in intracellular vesicles where they are not accessible by an agonist these receptors are however fully functional and can be recycled to the membrane when adrenergic overstimulation has ceased despite the existence of these various regulatory mechanisms and known detrimental effects of adrenergic overstimulation paradoxical increase in beta receptor functioning occur in some clinical disease state for example in ischemia condition beta receptors are upregulated so after 15 uh, minutes of uh, uh, period of myocardial ischemia significant increase in uh, functional receptor levels are found reperfusion rapidly decreases this number back to their normal levels now we come to the muscarinic receptors and signaling pathways muscarinic acetylcholine receptors the second major uh, receptor type in cardiac regulation is the muscarinic receptors although five subtypes of muscarinic receptor exist namely m1 m2 to m5 only one that is m2 is present in the cardiac tissue most of these muscarinic receptors are present on the atria so it was formally thought that the ventricles had no vagal innervation but this view turns out to be incorrect ventricles are innervated by the vagus nerve and muscarinic receptors are in fact present in her ventricles albeit their concentration is low than in atria the amount of muscarinic receptor protein in atrium is approximately two fold than in ventricle thus although the primary function of cardiac muscarinic uh, signaling is to control the heart rate through the action at the atrial level vagal stimulation can directly influence the ventricular functioning also so mechanism of action again the m2 receptors coupled to the gi proteins thereby inhibiting their inhibitory they are uh, therefore inhibit the adrenergic cyclase and decrease the intracellular cyclic amp level in ventricle muscarinic signaling primarily involves decreasing cy cyclic amp level in absence of adrenergic stimulation acetylcholine has little effect on ventricle in conditions of high adrenergic tone however muscarinic stimulation can modify the adrenergic effect now the regulation of muscarinic acetylcholine receptors whereas the role of atrial muscarinic receptors in impulse generation and the conjunction system is straight forward the role of ventricular muscarinic receptor is not clear it appears that under non non stressed condition muscarinic signaling has very little contribution on cardiac contractility in contrast the system may act as a brake on overstimulation when there is a adrenergic overdrive so the effects of muscarinic signaling which almost universally oppose those induced by adrenergic signaling may counteract the adrenergic effect so they preserve the cardiac functioning during prolonged stress responses unfortunately this compensatory mechanism may not be available in the aging heart so increased age is accompanied by changes in cardiac muscarinic receptor expression that uh, that may make it more difficult for the heart to respond to adrenergic stress the muscarinic system in aged heart may not be as well prepared to react to prolonged adrenergic stimulation such observed in hypertension and in cardiac failure patients with the exception of age muscarinic receptors are minimally affected in setting that profoundly modify the beta receptor expression so what are the other receptors 
as stated earlier heart and vasculature express many other g protein family apart from adrenergic and muscarinic receptors few, uh, few examples are angiotensin receptors which mediate the hormonal vasoconstriction in the vascular tree and are also present in the heart although their function is not fully defined then receptors for several purinergic compounds are also expressed in the heart histamine h2 receptor mediate the inotropic action of histamine and are affected by cardiovascular disease and for example vip receptors are down regulated in 70% of the population with idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy whereas histamine receptors are unaffected in general the receptor coupled to gi that is inhibitory show little alteration in expression and function during this state whereas g stimulatory coupled receptors are affected more profoundly that is beta receptors now the adenosine signaling adenosine signaling although the <clears throat> can be generated by several pathways in the heart it is usually found as a dephosphorylation product of amp because amp accumulation is a sign, a sign of low cellular energy change increase in adenosine concentration is a marker of unbalanced energy demand and supply thus ischemia and hypoxia uh, in this state it increased so catecholamine concentration are all associated with increased adenosine release adenosine is rapidly degraded by various pathways both by intracellular and extracellular mechanism its half life is very very short in order of some second therefore not only it is a marker of cardiac energy crisis but also its concentration fluctuate virtually instantly with energy balance of the heart it provides a real time indication of cellular energy situation so adenosine also signals to the g protein coupled receptors there are p1 and p2 these two purinergic uh, subclasses exist and uh, the p1 receptor is again divided into two main receptors a1 and a2 a1 is mostly present in the heart and it inhibit adenylate cyclase whereas a2 is present in the vasculature and when activated it stimulate the adenylate cyclase a2 receptor mediate the vasodilatory action of adenosine now uh, a1 receptors mediates its complex cardiac effects a1 uh, couples to two intracellular signaling pathways gi class and kach uh, channel the uh, through the same uh, presumably through the same gk protein adenosine activates this channel in the same way as the muscarinic receptor do and cardiac is, is electrophysiologic effect of acetylcholine and adenosine are therefore similar but this uh, a1 receptor is uh, virtually absent in the ventricle therefore in unstimulated heart adenosine shortens the atrial action potential it decreases the atrial refractoriness and decreases the atrial contractile force but it is almost without effect on ventricle so uh, uh, till the time we have discussed the uh, chemoreceptors now we move to the mechanoreceptors controlling the cardiac function there are atrial receptors ventricle receptors so we first uh, discuss with the atrial receptors the two types of atrial receptors are located in both atria and venoatrial junction they have been identified by the electrophysiological study the these sensory receptors are nothing but the nerve endings whose afferent fibers travel to the brain stem through the vagus nerve and the spinal uh, and the spinal via the uh, sympathetic nerves atrial type a receptors are during systole and they coincident with the a wave of the atrial pulse whereas atrial b receptors are activated during atrial filling that is volume overload and uh, uh, and they uh, fire the impulses which are coincident with the v wave of atrial pressure pulse so atrial b receptors are stimulated by mechanical stretch of the atrial wall or venoatrial junction which is caused by atrial filling the uh, now the reflex which are related to the uh, type b atrial receptors the type b atrial receptors are believed to play important role in reflex regulation of body fluid volume stimulation of these receptors by distension of atrium cause the reflex increase in heart rate Uh, this is called as bain bridge reflex the afferent pathways of this reflex is reported to be the, in the vagus and the efferent pathway entirely in the cardiac sympathetic nerves atrial type b endings are stress receptor and they respond to the pulsatile changes in atrial pressure and their <coughs> discharge activity is closely related to the volume of the atrium thus the atrial v wave to which the these endings response appear to be fairly accurate reflection of the atrial volume now type a atrial receptors they discharge in time with the atrial a wave the natural stimulus is the atrial contraction which increases the wall tension so uh, type a receptors signal the heart rate rather than atrial pressure since they respond to change in uh, heart rate 
now there are again other uh, fibers which which are coupled to the receptors which are unmyelinated afferent fibers innervating the atria these are group c fibers both type a and type b are myelinated and now this is group c it is unmyelinated endings that innervate the atria they are probably uh, they are uh, more slowly conducting unmyelinated afferent fibers than rapidly conducting type a and type b vessel afferent fibers they respond to stretch or the transfusion of the blood with a threshold response beginning at 1 to 3 mm change in blood pressure so in comparison to the myelinated fibers these uh, unmyelinated begin to discharge at higher pressure and response less to any change in atrial pressure so receptors innervated by atrial group c fibers in contrast to a and b are located diffusely throughout the atria and not only in the uh, uh, venoatrial group uh, venoatrial junction and they are also present in the interatrial septum and in the atrial appendages now what are the reflexes associated with vagal afferent fibers the first reflex is the bain uh, bain bridge reflex the stimula stimulation of either right or left atrial receptors increase the heart rate in 1 to 2 minutes with regard to other cardiovascular manifestation of this reflex distension of such well localized region of atria does not consistently change in arterial pressure and svr and myocardial contractility is also unaltered but there is a large increase in heart rate so though heart rate is increase but uh, myocardial contractility and svr doesn't change so some of the reflex tachycardia caused by venoatrial distension may come from activation of sympathetic afferent fibers so these afferents are via myelinated afferent fibers in the vagus nerve and if efferent limb of the reflex is mediated by increased sympathetic activity <clears throat> the physiologic importance is nothing but the uh, it may increase the cardiac output during situation of increased venous return distension of atria also increases the urine volume and urine output and decreases the discharge of renal sympathetic nerve if only venoatrial junctions are distended sympathetic tone to other organs is generally unaltered atrial receptor stimulation associated with expanded intramuscular volume causes diuresis now there are uh, ventricular receptors are also present which are, i have mentioned in this uh, table these are the unmyelinated ventricular receptors so the receptor location uh, the in the first in the first column we can see that the, these are uh, located diffusely in the ventricle these are mechanosensitive unmyelinated receptors the physiological stimulus for them is the change in diastolic pressure as well as change in systolic pressure so associated clinical conditions when this receptor get activated are nothing but the myocardial ischemia and hypotension in the uh, second row the again the receptor location is diffuse in the ventricle and the, this group consists of chemo sensitive unmyelinated receptor they respond to uh, chemical agents like bradykinin and prostaglandin which are nothing but the mediators of inflammation and which are mainly secreted during hypoxia and myocardial ischemia and also sign in coronary occlusion so the associated conditions are nothing but the uh, coronary uh, vascular diseases but uh, they do not relate to any cardiac cycle so what are the other uh, myelinated afferent fibers uh, in the ventricular receptors so these are innervated by myelinated fibers frequently discharged in isovolumic systole they are tension or pressure sensitive receptors since they begin to discharge at the onset of uh, left ventricular contraction which is at or just before the increase in intra uh, intraventricular pressure the functional importance is not significant then what are the reflexes the associated with Uh, ventricular receptor stimulation so distension of the lv causes reflex vasodilatation that is vasodilatation so peripheral vasodilatation is caused by withdrawal of the sympathetic vasoconstriction tone and bradycardia by increased parasympathetic discharge to the heart so whenever there is a increase in lv pressure it causes reflex vasodilatation and uh, and bradycardia so uh, now we come to certain pathological conditions in which these cardiac receptors play important role and they are coupled with certain reflexes which we see now in myocardial ischemia the occlusion of the coronary artery stimulates the receptive endings of both myelinated and unmyelinated vagal afferent fibers in the heart so but the mechanical rather than the chemical stimuli activate these receptors so myocardial ischemia can either increase or decrease the blood pressure because stimulation of sympathetic afferents reflexively increases and stimulation of vagal afferent fibers reflexively decreases decreases the discharge of sympathetic efferent nerves 
Now, ischemia also stimulates the mechanoreceptors with myelinated and unmyelinated sympathetic afferent because of wall motion abnormalities. So, sympathetic afferent fibers may transmit the sensation of pain, which is also associated with coronary artery occlusion, that is angina. So, what happens when uh, left anterior descending uh, artery gets occluded? What is the reflex activity and what is when uh, uh, left circumflex uh, artery gets occluded and what is the reflex mechanism due to subsequent receptors? So, when the uh, stimulation of receptors subsumed by circumflex coronary uh, occurs, it causes greater bradycardia and hypotension than stimulation of the receptors subsumed by LED territory. Uh, this differential uh, reflex effect is mostly due to the difference in number of receptor present in these two locations. <clears throat> and it is not due to the drug concentration or uh, muscle mass perfused by LAD or LCX. Now, what happens in inferior MI? Another uh, symptom which is frequently associated with the, these patients is the nausea and vomiting. So, uh, stimulation of unmyelinated vagal afferent fibers, either with chemicals or other, uh, or with the myocardial ischemia, causes the gastric relaxation. This relaxation lead to nausea and vomiting associated with posterior or uh, inferior acute myocardial infarction. <clears throat> now, uh, what happens after the post reperfusion of the coronaries? So, reperfusion of the RCA following intracoronary uh, thrombolytic therapy or after stenting causes uh, bradycardia and hypotension, which we routinely see. In contrast, successful uh, LAD per reperfusion only infrequently causes this hemodynamic pattern. In fact, uh, LAD perfusion is more <coughs> frequently associated with hypertension and tachyarrhythmias or increase in ventricular ectopy. Thus, re uh, reperfusion of acutely ischemic posterior or inferior myocardium causes a uh, so called basal geris reflex, while reperfusion of the anterior myocardium more commonly causes excitatory reflexes, that is, tachycardia, hypertension, and some ectopics. Now, what happens when uh, one do the coronary angiography? Injection of the contrast dye in the coronary artery also causes reflex cholinergic vasodilatation in the forearm. Thus, contrast dye can induce reflex bradycardia and systemic vasodilatation by stimulating the various cardiac receptors. And atropine is the drug of choice in the said scenario. Now, in the congestive cardiac failure, the patients with congestive cardiac failure have high LA pressures and high antidiuretic hormone levels. Inappropriately high ADH level may contribute to the peripheral edema, ascites, and hyponatremia in these patients. Although ADH level would be expected to decrease as a result of increased stretch on the LA, uh, left atrial receptor may adapt or may be reset when they are subjected to chronic stretch. So in acute conditions, it may bring down the ADH level down, but in chronically uh, congested heart, uh, the effects are tolerated. This means left atrial receptors, they get adapted and they may reset. So uh, now uh, the aortic stenosis. In patients with aortic stenosis, syncope episodes are common. These are uh, these develop due to decrease in forearm vascular resistance, whereas normal subject develop increased forearm vascular resistance. This paradoxical vasodilatation caused by cardiac receptor stimulation may explain some cases of syncope in patients with aortic stenosis, and particularly it is seen in uh, exercise state. Now to summarize, the cardiac receptors include both mechanical and chemical sensitive receptor located in the atria and the ventricle. Atrial receptor innervated by myelinated vagal afferents uh, reflexively regulate the heart rate and intravascular volume. On the other hand, stimulation of ventricular receptors can cause either reflex bradycardia and hypotension or alternatively excitation of cardiovascular system. The formal response is mediated by vagal afferents, whereas the latter is due to the sympathetic spinal afferents. Under normal conditions, cardiac receptors sense the changes in wall motion or diastolic pressure and perhaps provide a fine tuning of cardiovascular system. However, under certain uh, pathological conditions such as coronary ischemia, which was uh, release of certain substances that is bradykinin and prostaglandin, and they may exaggerate the response of ventricular receptors. Because these receptors cause reflex depression of cardiovascular system and in particular induce renal vasodilatation, they may protect the heart and kidney by lessening the myocardial oxygen requirement and by increasing the renal blood flow by causing diuresis and natriuresis. In this situation of heart failure, both atrial and ventricular receptors are reset and therefore provide for an exaggerated neurohormonal discharge. Finally, patients with aortic stenosis may demonstrate a paradoxical vasodilatation and syncope during exercise when there likely is excessive stimulation of left ventricular receptor by high transpural pressure. Thank you.
Thank you, Gaurav, for this expansive presentation. Thank you. Now, so stop sharing your screen, please. Yes. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Gaurav, for this uh, expansive presentation on receptors regulating cardiac function. Let yeah. us now continue with this interactive session. Okay, before uh, proceeding ahead, let's go ahead with uh, some of the defining some of the terms that we are going to be using regularly uh, during this uh, presentation. The first one is inotropy. Can somebody tell me among the students? Uh, I request all the students to be kindly unmute themselves and we'll go by uh, alphabetical order of their first names, please. I don't know most of the students, so I think we can just, the students can themselves select among themselves and start answering one by one. Hello, let's start off with Gaurav only. What's the first term, term Gaurav, inotropy? Inotropy is increasing force of contraction. Yeah, very good. So, anotropy means increased force of contractility. Chronotropy, next. Increasing please. the heart rate. Okay, increase in the heart rate. Luciotropy? In vas the dilatation, cardiac dilatation. Relaxation of. Re relaxation. So, the right word is increase in the diastolic relaxation. That is luciotropism. What is bathmotropy? Increase the speed of conduction. No, it's actually increasing the excitability of the cardiac okay. muscles. Uh, increase in con AV conduction is called as dromotropy. The next word. What is vasopressor? What does a vasopressor mean? It increases the peripheral vascular resistance. The systemic vascular resistance. So anything which presses the vessels. So anything which causes the increase in the systemic vascular resistance will be a vasopressor. And what would be a vasodilator be? Decrease in the SVR, sir. Yes. Anything which dilates the vessels. Now, before proceeding ahead, let's go ahead with some of the few principles which guide the cardiac and the vascular function. Can anybody tell me what is Frank Starling law? Uh, this law. Frank Starling law. Uh, force of contraction is proportional to the initial length of muscle fiber. Correct. Correct. So uh, the force of myocardial contraction is directly proportional to the length of the muscle fiber. So in other words, it indicates that the force of contraction is directly proportional to the preload of the heart. Correct? Yeah. So what is the trepe phenomenon or also called as the Bowditch phenomenon? The staircase phenomenon, it means that yes. uh, increase in heart rate, uh, with each increase in heart rate, the force of contraction gradually increases. Yeah, very good. What is ANDREP phenomenon? ANDREP uh, phenomenon basically... Myocardial contractility increases if SVR increases. Is ANDREP yeah, so increase in afterload increases the myocardial contractility. How does it do that? Basically, whenever there is increase in the afterload, there will be increase in the end systolic volume, which will in turn increase preload in the ventricle. So as, go, as going by the Frank Starling law, increase in the preload will increase contractility. What is Laplace's law? Uh, force is directly proportional to pressure and radius. It's not force. It's actually afterload of wall stress. So the, yeah, so the wall stress of the heart in the ventricle is directly proportional to the intraventricular pressure to the intra uh, to the ventricle the radius of the ventricular chamber and inversely proportional to the thickness of thickness. the ventricle. So Laplace is law. So can you explain the Andrew phenomena again? Then go ahead. Andrew, uh, sorry, Andrew phenomena. Yes, sir. Okay. 
So NREF phenomenon means that whenever there is an increase in afterload, it will lead to an increase in myocardial contractility. Now, how does it happen is whenever the SVR goes up or the, uh, there will be uh, opposition to the contraction of the ventricle. So ineffectively, the end systolic volume, that is the volume in the ventricle at the end of systole will be much more than when the uh, afterload was lower. Oh, now, when it. the end system, yeah. so that's how the preload of the ventricle increases, and as the preload increases, the contractility also will increase. Okay. That is what the NREF phenomenon stands for. Clear? Yeah, yes, sir. Okay. Now, what is the goal? Why are we studying all this about uh, why to when to use anotropes, which anotropes to use, when to use vasoactive medications? The basic goal is to maintain tissue oxygenation and perfusion. Now here, it's very important that whenever we are using these medications or whenever there is a scenario that is building up, one has to concentrate not just on the cardiac output, but also on the pressure. That means the organ function, any end organ function depends upon both the things. What, what is the amount of flow going to the organ as well as at what pressure it is going. So whenever we are dealing with these medications, it's very important that all efforts are targeted not only towards maintaining cardiac output, that is the flow, but also to maintain the pressure, that is the pressure head, which will maintain the perfusion pressure, that is the mean arterial pressure. So all these efforts are towards improving the cardiac output as well as towards maintaining a good mean arterial pressure. So that is the that should be the goal whenever we are using these medications. Now this is the formula all of us know. The mean arterial pressure depends upon, can somebody tell me what is the formula for mean arterial pressure? It's uh, two-third of the diastolic pressure and one-third of the systolic pressure. Okay. Can we go by this formula, what we are, what we are seeing on the screen? Can you define uh, pressure in terms of these variables? Um, okay, no problem. So SVR pressure is basically, basically map minus CVP upon cardiac output into AP. So if oh, you that is a mathematical that, formula. Yeah, okay, that's, okay. The, that's the right thing you're talking about. But let's okay. discuss with regards to this diagram. So okay. pressure is basically cardiac output into systemic vascular resistance. Correct? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, cardiac output is given by the formula stroke Oops, volume into heart. Into heart, heart rate. rate. Okay. Yeah. The factors affecting the stroke volume are preload, contractility, load. and afterload. After load. After load. Okay. Now, as we discussed, that flow and pressure. So, this formula takes care about the pressure. But what is ultimately required is good tissue perfusion, so oxygenation. Hence, the lower part of the screen shows you the next formula that is the oxygen delivery, DO2. Oxygen delivery is a function of the oxygen content as well as the cardiac output. And as mm. we can see, oxygen content will depend not only on the hemoglobin, but also on the PO2. Hence, mm. ventilation also is a very important part of delivery of good oxygenation and good tissue perfusion. That's why when the patients decompensate, it is important to maintain their oxygenation, either using a mask or intubation or putting them on the ventilator. Mm. Now, this is again the same formula. It just shows where the various agents work. Okay, if you can see, uh, I mean, uh, the chronotropy is shown on the heart rate, inotropism is shown on the stroke volume, afterload is shown opposite the stroke volume, luciotropism will affect your end diastolic volume by producing good diastolic relaxation. Now, uh, just, to, uh, just to summarize what uh, Dr. Gaurav said, the, uh, the main receptors which are of interest for us from the cardiac point of view are alpha, beta, D1 and D2 refers to the dopamine receptors, dopamine receptor 1, dopamine receptor 2, and one group of receptors called V receptors. They are the vasopressin receptors, V1 and V2. Now, as you said, alpha is, has alpha 1, alpha 2. Now, alpha 1 is primarily vasopressor activity. Alpha 2 is present in the central nervous system, so it mediates sedation, vasodilatation, all those things. Beta is, has beta 1 and beta 2. Now, beta 1 is primarily present on the heart, so produces chronotropism and inotropism, while beta-2 is primarily present in the smooth muscle of the vessels, both in the, uh, of the blood vessels as well as in the bronchus. So it produces vasodilatation and bronchodilatation. And dopamine receptors are of two types, D1 and D2. D2 are present again in the central nervous system, so they mediate uh, the, the effect of dopamine on the central nervous system. 
while dopamine uh, one d1 receptors are the ones which are present on the vas- on, on the smooth muscle of the vessels so they produce splanchnic and renal vasodilatation now v1 and v2 are the vasopressin receptors so these vasopressin receptors again v1 uh, is is present on the smooth muscles of the vessels so they induce vasoconstriction while v2 is present in the kidneys the collecting duct of the kidneys so by acting at at the distal tubule and the connecting duct of the kidneys they ensure or they they produce what is called as water reabsorption through that that's why there is retention of water whenever you give vasopressin to these patients now coming to classification of these drugs now th- these drugs are classified based on what is their chemical composition what is their origin how they act where they act duration of action lot of drugs so here we are going by the basic uh, simple classification first we go to sympathomimetics now based on their chemical composition they could be natural or synthetic now natural natural the natural ones are ones which are available which are present in the body they include adrenaline noradrenaline and dopamine while synthetic ones dobutamine dopamine phenylephrine metronidazole ephedrine these are all sympathomimetics because they act directly on the sympathetic nervous system through either the alpha or the beta receptors or the dopamine receptors some other group of drugs other than these will be those which are dependent on cyclic amp now cyc- like uh, the example of the cyclic amp dependent uh, drugs would be one common example is phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitor now phosphodiesterase uh, enzyme it inhibits the metabol it uh, produces the metabolism of cyclic amp so by inhibiting this enzyme you increase the concentration of cyclic amp in the circulation there are some other group of drugs which are cyclic amp independent they fall into this category of calcium sensitizers or cardiac glycosides like digoxin then you have vasopressors and you have vasodilators now we'll discuss only the common ones which we encounter in our clinical practice so can somebody go ahead with uh, what uh, these uh, has everybody used these drugs dopamine dopamine adrenaline isoprenaline yes sir yeah so these are called as inotropes now as going by the definition their primary function is to increase myocardial contractility now let's start the first drug can one of you start about dopamine let's keep it like a table wise okay it's not possible to cover everything in chemical composition whatever is important for us from user point of view let us discuss those points so can one of you start with dopamine what, what, what is it that we should know about dopamine anyone dopamine acts on d1 and d2 receptors sir okay and uh, also has uh, act on a small dose on alpha you know also sir okay and dose dependent activity uh, very good they believe to have dose dependent activity of 5 0 to 5 mics there has a renal vasoconstrictor property uh, from 5 to 15 mics as cardiac contractility activity and more than uh, uh, 15 have vasodilatory factor okay okay so coming to dopamine so dopamine basically as you rightly said acts on three levels at the dopamine one at the beta one and the alpha one of this effect are dose dependent so at lower doses it will act only on the dopamine one receptor and produce primarily vasodilatation renal vasodilatation and splanchnic vasodilatation thereby producing increased diuresis at at moderate levels of 3 to 10 microgram per kg per minute it will act primarily on beta 1 receptors thereby producing positive inotropism and positive chronotropism while if the dose goes above 10 microgram per kg per minute it produces alpha 1 action so vasoconstriction will take over now dopamine has because of these very dose dependent responses the usage of dopamine has gone down and also with the use of more specific drugs and better drugs which are more targeted towards heart function the other drugs usage has increased one of the major problems with use of dopamine was the incidence of high incidence of tachycardia let's go to the next drug dopamine can somebody talk about dop- dopamine anyone dopamine acts on beta 1 receptors beta 1 and beta 2 receptors okay good so what will be the effect be effect it will, it will increase contractility is decrease the after load okay anything else what will it do to the heart rate will it affect the heart rate also and increase yeah, the heart rate. the heart rate sir okay so dobutamine dobutamine has both as you rightly said beta 1 beta 2 effects but 
but the beta one effect is much more than the beta two. So it produces good amount of inotropism and chromotropism. Uh, chronotropism. One very important point about dobutamine is it produces some amount of luciotropism also. Luciotropism is diastolic relaxation. Okay, so it has some amount of luciotropism effect also. Now, because of the beta two effect, it will reduce the SVR, produce vasodilatation, and can produce hypotension. One very important point is as you increase the dose of dobutamine, it can increase the myocardial oxygen consumption. So, which scenario would you use dobutamine? What would be a good scenario to use dobutamine? Oh, sir, uh, uh, failure. Uh, sorry, sorry, one by one, one by one, anyone. Post cardiac bypass. In which scenario? Post CPB is up. Cardiogenic shock. Okay. In CABG, would you be, let let's go step by step. When you're doing a coronary artery bypass surgery, let's say on off pump surgery, would you use dobutamine? And in what scenario? If the PA pressures are higher, sir. Okay. Very good. So any condition, uh, suppose if you're doing off pump CABG and during the surgery, if your PA pressure goes high, there is hypotension, ventricular distension or bradycardia, dobutamine would be a good drug in this case because it will produce good heart rate. It will improve your contractility. It will produce good relaxation. And if there is an underlying MR, which has developed because of ischemia during grafting, by reducing the afterload, it will also reduce the MR, thereby reducing the PA pressures. In cardiogenic shock, in which scenario would you use dobutamine? Can you use dobutamine in all scenarios of cardiogenic shock or in a particular scenario only? Not in all scenarios, sir. Because so in other words, what would be one factor which will limit your use of dobutamine? It will decrease SVR, sir. So? Yes, in hypotension. Yes, very good. So if your systemic blood pressure is less than 90, Dobutamine would not be an ideal drug in that scenario. But if cardiogenic shock is, uh, patient is present to you in cardiogenic shock and the systolic pressure is more than 90, you can start off with low amount of dobutamine. Sometimes when you're using dobutamine and you anticipate that pressure might fall, you can top it up or cover it up with some with a low dose of some vasopressor. So that is what that's about dobutamine. Let's talk about the next drug. Adrenaline, anybody? It's a pure adrenergic uh, agonist. So it acts okay. on all alpha, beta, uh, alpha 1, alpha 2, beta 1, and beta 2. Okay. Uh, at uh, uh, lower doses, it acts predominantly on beta, but at higher doses, it acts both on alpha, beta and, and alpha also. Okay. So what what type of effect will it produce? Purely inotropic drugs. Mostly okay. inotropic. Inotropic? Uh, Heart and rate? chronotropic. And chronotropic, chronotropic also. Okay, yeah, chronotropic very good. SVR? Uh, in SVR, sir, at higher it doses, it has, it will have alpha action, so it will have uh, vasoconstriction also. Okay, very increases, good. Myocardioxin yes. consumption? It increases myocardioxin. Increases. Okay, very good. So coming to, now, adrenaline also has a dose-dependent response. At very low doses, less than 0 0.03 microgram per kg per minute, it will act primarily on the beta-2 receptors. So if you're using very highly diluted adrenaline, it can produce severe vasodilatation and produce a fall in blood pressure. However, if the do in the medium doses, its first effect will be on beta one. So increase heart rate, increase contractility. And as you rightly said, when the dose increases beyond 0.15 microgram per kg per minute, it will produce alpha one uh, effect and produce vasopressor, uh, uh, increase the SVR <clears throat> and produce vasopressor effect. Now, one major problem, as we rightly said, it can produce tachycardia. Now, and it has, because of this potential, it can also be arrhythmogenic and it increases myocardial oxygen consumption. What would be the uses of adrenaline? In which scenario would you use them? In anaphylactic shock. Okay. Then? In during CPCR. Okay, very good. Intraoperative, any scenario in which you can use, would you like to use uh, during surgery, post surgery, adrenaline? Post cardiac surgery. Yeah, post cardiac bypass also we can use, sir. 
okay so it's a good drug to be used perioperatively also uh, especially if suppose uh, your systemic pressure remains low your contractility is poor you can't start dobutamine as we rightly discussed that if the blood, systemic blood pressure is on the lower side then you have to use adrenaline instead of using higher doses of adrenaline you can either you use moder- you use a combination of drugs depending upon how the hemodynamics are so in cardiogenic shock also if the blood pressure is less than 90 adrenaline along with a bit of along with a dose of uh, nor adrenaline would be a good drug to start off and as we know that in the cpr guidelines adrenaline is the drug of choice for all patients isoprenaline let's talk about discuss a few things about isoprenaline mechanism of action it's a pure beta agonist sir so okay beta 1 and beta 2 so okay. increase in heart rate Okay. And uh, uh, mechanism added, and it also reduces uh, HPR. Beta. I am uh, actually some some books uh, some authors suggest using it even in increased PVR cases because it reduces the pulmonary vascular resistance also. Another important okay. thing is it's a directly acting uh, agent, so even in heart transplant patients, it will act. Why do you use it in heart transplant patients? In case in case if you want to have an increase in heart rate patient, those who have a bradycardia and don't want to use spacing then it can be used. okay very good very good so you have covered most of the points so isoprenaline again non specific beta so it has beta 1 beta 2 effect because of this it will produce good amount of inotropism it will produce increase in heart rate and because of the beta 2 it will produce good amount of vasodilatation also now as you rightly mentioned this vasodilatation will act both on the systemic as well as in the pulmonary circulation so it's a good drug to have and good drug to use if your heart rate is low and patient has underlying severe pulmonary artery hypertension but there is a side effect because it produces vasodilatation can produce fall in blood pressure so all many times you will need to add a vasopressor to it whenever you are using isoprenaline now there is another side effect to it because it produces dilatation of all the vessels in normal in, in it can produce dilatation of the coronaries and produce the phenomenon of coronary steel thereby increasing myocardial ischemia that is one of the reasons why it is also used in where is it used because of this phenomenon coronary steel stress test as a replacement of dobutamine you can use isoprenaline also okay it's a pro arrhythmic uh, because of its increased tendency to increase heart rate it's a pro arrhythmic drug and the ideal situation to use it when there is bradycardia you don't have pacing you don't want to pace or you don't have pacing options or if patient has severe pulmonary artery hypertension or in patients with rv dysfunction whether it is because primarily because of our, uh, whether the pathology is in the right ventricle or whether it is whether the rv dysfunction is secondary to per- severe pulmonary artery hypertension isoprenaline along with noradrenaline would be a good drug of choice and as you rightly mentioned in heart transplant many of these heart transplant patients will have high pvr they might have a post transplant they may have low lower rate so it could be a good drug to use not only to increase the heart rate but also to increase the contractility as well as to reduce the pulmonary vascular resistance now coming to vasopressors Now basically there are three types of vasopressors that we are using in clinical practice noradrenaline vasopressin and phenylephrine can somebody discuss about noradrenaline please so it has uh, it has alpha it has alpha 1 uh, normally alpha 1 uh, action and uh, as well as uh, beta 1 sir Mm-hmm. and uh, so noradrenaline as such uh, it will always increase uh, keep the pressure at increase svr okay so coming to noradrenaline it is primarily a mo- uh, alpha 1 agonist so it produces increased svr is a vasopressor it it is said that it does have some amount of beta activity also but primary effect is at alpha level so the systemic vascular resistance will increase and because of which it increases the systolic blood pressure the diastolic pressure and the mean arterial pressure thereby improving the coronary blood flow now because it does not have significant beta activity there is not much change in the heart rate hence it's a ideal drug to be used in patients undergoing which type of cases cpgs yes because it will not produce much increase in myocardial oxygen consumption while increasing the coronary blood flow so all patients of uh, undergoing the cabg it could be it should be the first drug to be used 
also patients undergoing cardiac surgery post bypass or perioperative period you can use it even all patients coming to you with cardiogenic shock this is considered to be one of the frontline drug that you should use because to improve the perfusion pressures next drug vasopressin v1 v2 agonist sir okay Uh, increases the uh, pulmonary uh, peripheral vascular resistance okay more than the hsvr okay it is actually uh, useful uh, to counteract the vasoplegia because of uh, cardiopulmonary bypass very good uh, it can anything uh, else also in uh, shock uh, septic shock conditions also not related okay. to cardiac surgery though okay okay good But it can in because of increase in afterload uh, long term use can cause uh, peripheral gangrene and all also because if it increases the afterload uh, myocardial oxygen demand also increases okay so vasopressin as we discussed acts by two receptors v1 and v2 v1 is present on the vascular smooth muscles so it produces vasopressor effect and v2 is present on the renal collecting duct so it produces water reabsorption primary effect that we use it for is vasoconstriction but it can produce it's a much stronger vasopressor compared to noradrenaline so it can produce intense vasoconstriction especially the dangerous ones are limb ischemia or mesenteric ischemia so one has to be whenever you are using vasopressin you have to be very careful and monitor both limb the limb perfusion as well as perfusion of the mesenteric so rise to vasopressin gurk monitoring abdomen abdom, uh, keep a watch on the abdomen also now the the scenarios in which you can use vasopressin first is cpr why do you prefer uh, vasopressin in cpr is there any particular reason single dose vasopressin has been indicated as one of the treatments in patients presenting to with uh, arrest in arrest scenarios what is the reason one reason that they mention this is very important volume sorry anti diuresis so volume will be present so increases uh, the uh, preload not so much that way but one very important feature of vasopressin is that normally hypoxia and acidosis they blunt the effect of all the adrenergic drugs but vasopressin is not affected by any hypoxia and acidosis so there are a lot of studies which have shown that early insufficient of vasopressin in arrest scenario leads to better outcome post uh, cpr similar so there is a lot there are a lot of studies which have shown this hence so this is the reason why it could be one of the frontline drugs in patients presented to you with arrest similarly in septic shock sorry Sir, sir, uh, how much drug do you give, sir, in a case for us? Sorry, I can't hear. During you. CPR. Uh, during See, CPR, how much see, drug do you give, sir? Forty units uh, is given. Forty yes. international. So, as per the CPR. guidelines, uh, once you have given the first dose of adrenaline, one shot of vasopressin can be given up to forty units. As she rightly mentioned, as a bolus. If you are using it as an infusion, you can use an, uh, in an adult patient about one to two units per hour. Okay. Okay, it's one to two units per hour. It is available as a twenty unit per ml uh, ampule. Okay. So in in patients of septic shock also, because the major pathology there again is is fall in SBR, so it is a good drug to start. And similarly, in patients with refractory cardiogenic shock, wherein you have used your frontline therapies, you have used lobotamine, you have used adre uh, adrenaline, you have used tar adrenaline, you put the patient on balloon pump, but still, if you feel that the pressure, systemic pressure is not coming up, the perfusion pressure is not coming up. then you can institute vasopressin also again in this scenario the reason is the same because as the duration of therapy with other inotropes and uh, inotropes increases and hypoxia and acidosis starts building up the effect of the other adrenergic drugs like adrenaline noradrenaline dobutamine goes down but this does not hold true for vasopressin wherein the efficiency of vasopressin even in presence of severe hypoxia and acidosis persists so vasopressin is a good drug to improve hemodynamics in patients with refractory cardiogenic shock next drug phenylephrine let's discuss about phenylephrine your alpha agonist sir okay uh, increases the svr okay mm, used in uh, vasoplegic states sir very good vasoplegic states anything else mm, reflex bradycardia will be there sir And that's okay, but any other condition uh, wherein you will use it? CBG cases where require only pressures. 
anything more specific can you use it on bypass on pump yes sir we can use it to maintain uh, uh, pressures of around okay. 50 to 70 pressure so perfusion to maintain perfusion pressure mean pressures on pump you can use it as a as either as a bolus or, the, or as an infusion any other particular use in pediatric age group can you use it in any particular scenario sir in top cyanotic patients fantastic very good hmm. so how does it act in cyanotic patients increases the sgr yeah, yeah. so decreases right to left channel right. decrease okay hmm. very good so phenylephrine basically as you rightly mentioned it's a potent alpha activity primary effect is increase in sgr and increases the mean arterial pressure does not produce much change in heart rate so it is used in cardiopulmonary bypass to improve the perfusion pressures on pump as you have my rightly mentioned it is used for uh, treatment of a tet spell or a top spell it can be used a very good drug to use for patients who have gone into severe drug induced vasodilatation and an important subgroup of patients where it could be of some help is fixed cardiac output states wherein the entire blood pressure and the systemic perfusion is dependent on the svr so these patients if the svr falls down like in patients with severe aortic stenosis severe mitral stenosis or hocm hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy in these patients you can use low doses of phenylephrine to improve the perfusion pressures so that is about phenylephrine okay now this so this finishes our sympathomimetic drugs let's go to the other group of drugs this is phosphodiesterase inhibitors as we rightly discussed phosphodiesterase 3 inhibits the breakdown of cyclic amp to amp thereby increasing the level of cyclic amp now this cyclic amp not only produces positive inotropism it also produces good amount of vasodilatation so this is the drug the example of phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitor milrinone can somebody discuss about milrinone please so it's a lucidotropic drug sir one okay it's an inodilator uh, basically okay mm -hmm. inodilator so it will produce positive inotropic effect yes. basically increases the levels of calcium for the so better that? contractility of the heart uh, that is no no no, no 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 let's not get that confused is this, is this is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor it does not increase calcium it increases cyclic amp so uh, positive inotropism is correct it, uh, it decreases uh, pulmonary vascular resistance and improves the rd function okay okay so milrinone as we said it's a pdpe uh, phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitor it's a very good inotrope as somebody mentioned it's got good luciotropism so it produces good diastolic relaxation just one word of this thing here good what does good diastolic relaxation mean it means that when the diast when there is good diastolic relaxation the heart is able to contract better so the inotropism is better in presence of good luciotropism so hence luciotropism becomes a very important character of a drug it does not affect the heart rate or the or the myocardial oxygen consumption much it reduces the svr and the pulmonary vascular resistance both so produces good amount of vasodilatation hence in most scenarios you will have to use it along with the pressure agent now one very unique property of milrinone is that it's got a long half life of around 2 to 4 hours approximately around 2.5 to 3 hours hence even when you stop milrinone the action does last beyond discontinuation the dose, now some, some books also mention that you can give a bolus dose of milrinone before starting an infusion but the major problem of starting of giving a bolus dose is it produces intense vasodilatation so can produce hypotension hence if you want to give a bolus dose it's best to be given intraoperatively when the patient is on pump so you can control the hemodynamics better and before starting milrinone because it's a vasodilator can produce hypotension always correct hypovolemia now very important point about milrinone is that it does not act by alpha or beta receptors so in patients of heart failure especially chronic heart failure wherein as gorov mentioned that beta receptors get down regulated meaning the number of beta receptors goes down and the sensitivity of the beta receptors also goes down so in those patients patients of chronic heart failure uh, dobutamine adrenaline noradrenaline may not work that well so in those patients milrinone would be the drug of choice because it, it is very helpful it does not act by those receptors so a down regulated beta would not be required and milrinone's efficiency will be good in patients with chronic heart failure 
Now also, milrinone's vasodilatation and luciotropism effect is better than dobutamine. It is less arrhythmogenic. It produce, because it produces more profound fall in pulmonary vascular resistance. It is a good drug to be used in patients with preoperative severe pulmonary artery hypertension, as well as patients who have preoperative RV dysfunction, either primarily RV dysfunction or RV dysfunction secondary to severe pulmonary artery hypertension. Milrinone would be a good drug. Less chances of tachyphylaxis, less myocardial oxygen, less increase in myocardial oxygen consumption. As we discussed, it is a good drug to uh, use in patients with acute decompensation in cases of chronic uh, chronic heart failure. It is also a good drug to use as a bridge to heart transplant. Suppose a heart transplant patient decompensates and presents to you with heart with acute heart failure. In those cases, anyway, the, the, there is going to be down regulation of beta receptors, so adrenaline may not work that well. Dobutamine may not work that well. So in this scenario, milrinone would be the drug of choice. The other advantage of you can put these patients on ambulatory milrinone therapy through a peripheral line and put them as bridge to heart transplant. And as we discussed, it's a good drug to use in all patients with high pulmonary vascular resistance and severe pulmonary artery hypertension. Coming to the next drug, calcium sensitizer. Can somebody talk about calcium sensitizer? Levosimendan is one of the examples of calcium sensitizer. Can somebody talk about levosimendan, please? Sir, it will decrease the uh, 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 uptake of uh, calcium and uh, therefore it uh, increases the number of calcium available uh, for uh, uh, binding to the troponin and so hence it enhances the uh, uh, rate of contraction, sir. Very good. What are other effects of levosimenda? Okay. So levosimendan basically comes under, as you rightly mentioned, it comes under the group of calcium sensitizers. So it increases intracellular calcium and sensitizes, makes the cell more sensitive to this calcium. Besides this, it also ha it acts on the potassium ATPS channel as an opener of the potassium ATPS channel. It is known to have small amount of phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitor activity also. As a result of all this, it's a very good inotrope. It produces good diastolic relaxation, so excellent luciotropism. It can produce tachycardia because of its uh, calcium sensitizing. Because of these effects, uh, and it can, it, because of the phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitor activity, it can produce good amount of vasodilatation, which can be both arterial as well as venous. Now, because of opening of this potassium ATPS channel, it does produce some amount of ischemic preconditioning. Now, because of these vasodilator properties, as we discussed just like milrinone, if you're giving it as a bolus, it can produce hypotension. Again, it is a good drug to use in patients with heart failure, both acute heart failure as well as chronic heart failure. Primarily, again, same reason, because it works well in patients who have down regulation of the beta receptors. Ideal dose is around 0.05 to 0.2 micrograms per kg per minute. Now, the last group of drugs in this inotrope is digoxin. Can somebody talk about digoxin? It's a cardiac glycoside, sir. Okay. How does it act? Yeah. So uh, it's uh, it basically uh, it acts on uh, uh, it competes with the sodium potassium channel. Hence, uh, it increases the uh, 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 one is just direct effect and that's indirect effect. Sir. Direct mm -hmm. effect is by increasing the uh, contractility, sir. And indirect okay. effect is like it uh, decreases the uptake of norepinephrine at the uh, nerve terminals, and then uh, again it will uh, increase the uh, inotropic effect. Correct. So digoxin basically inhibits the sodium potassium ATPA, thereby increases the intracellular calcium. It, the major advantage of digoxin is that it's available in an oral form. But the major what is the major disadvantage of digoxin? Long half life, sir. Anything else? Narrow therapeutic index. So as, as I mentioned in this slide, it's got a very narrow therapeutic index. Means what? What does narrow therapeutic index mean? Uh, you should be cautious regarding its uh, serum concentration and subsequent okay. uh, lab necessary. So, what are the factors which affect it? One is electrolyte potassium level, sir. Yes. So, electrolyte imbalances, hypokalemia, less of potassium, less of magnesium, and large and higher quantity of calcium. So, hypercalcemia, hypokalemia, hypomagnesium. Many of these patients who are on digoxin will also be on diuretics. 
because of heart underlying heart failure uh, myocardial dysfunction so hence it becomes important to monitor the level of these uh, electrolytes as, as well as the risk of toxicity of digoxin increases in presence of these electrolyte imbalances hence because of these toxic toxic effects which primarily manifest in the form of proarrhythmic agent it can produce any type of arrhythmia right from supraventricular to ventricular arrhythmias including heart blocks hence the usage of digoxin is very limited in the present scenario in the presence of much more specific drugs both oral as well as iv however digoxin still has a very important role a, and a place in the treatment of chronic heart failure patients okay a few things about vasodilators uh, the two prototype drugs that we use regularly now in our practice are nitroglycerin and snp what is the difference between the two anybody what is the difference between nitro ntg and snp snp is around the vasodilator one is predominantly vasodilator sir which is vino and which is vano sir ntg is predominantly is predominantly arterial dilator uh, okay. ntg is predominantly vino dilator sir okay very good so primarily vino dilator is ntg so it will reduce the preload and primarily arterial dilator is snp so it will produce fall in svr and produce hypotension now what the major problems with these two drugs are both of them produce reflex tachycardia and there is development of significant tachyphylaxis with its use as you as the duration of usage keeps increasing or the dosage of usage keeps increasing there is tachyphylaxis to this drug there is a chance of cyanide toxicity and methemoglobin anemia occurring with sodium nitroprusside and ntg and the major this is it has got a very rapid onset so it can be used fast but there is a rapid offset also of these agents okay now this finishes a basic uh, thing about most of the common we have, we have not discussed all the drugs available but we have discussed the commonest use drugs which are used in clinical usage a few points about some novel novel agents which are in in research at the level of research and in animal studies the first drug is estaroxim this is supposed to be a sodium potas uh, potassium atps inhibitor producing good inotropism and luciotropism but no vasodilatation the second drug is omecamtiv mecarbil this is acts at the level of cardiac myosin that is the muscle that is the muscle protein at the level of the cardiac myocyte it is an activator of the cardiac myosin and by activating the cardiac myosin produces good amount of inotropism but does not produce any increase in oxygen consumption the other drug is nitroxyl which is similar to nitric oxide it, it is a potent arterial and veno dilator producing good amount of inotropism and luciotropism however compared to other ntg and snp does not produce much of it's not shown to produce much of tolerance or tachyphylax now gene therapy targeted towards increasing the sarcoplasmic reticulum calcium pump activity studies also are going on it it can produce uh, improvement in systolic as well as diastolic function so that finishes our some of the novel agents and novel therapies which are available let's go to some clinical scenarios Okay, one by one we'll answer. Now, suppose your patient is on table undergoing off pump CABG. What will be your based on whatever discussion we we have had? What will be the first drug of choice in this patient? Off pump CABG. Noradrenaline. Noradrenaline. Very good. Why? We want to keep the pressures high with uh, increased vascular resistance because we can't increase the rate more right. because it okay. will um, okay. interact Very with good. the surgery. so increase svr with no not much increase in myocardial oxygen consumption correct so now suppose this patient suddenly develops starts developing hypotension bradycardia with rise in pa pressures going up and you on, when you see suppose you have a t on table you see new onset mitral regurgitation occurring and lv is getting distended what drug will you add dobutamine dobutamine will be not positioned there so the drug as you rightly mentioned dobutamine we will as milrinone also could be a good choice now suppose if the blood pressure falls to below 90 at that time then what would be the drug your pa pressure is high but your pressure systemic pressure has gone down uh, add some other Adren pressure like noradrenaline plus noradrenaline already going on that was Adrenaline. the first one we added then you added dobutamine adrenaline adrenaline or vasopressin Vas vasopressin 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 no we will add adrenaline first because what do you think is the problem here what do you think is the problem now your pressure is going down pa pressure is going up not getting controlled with dobutamine poor contractility very good poor contractility one second thing is okay poor contractility 
ongoing okay, mitral ischemia poor contractility onset of mr mitral regurgitation ischemia okay so in this case if you add vasopressin first it will further increase the svr and further worsen the afterload further worsen the mitral regurgitation so you may not get a good benefit in terms of uh, good um, in, in terms of uh, decrease in lv distension fall in pa pressure so the third drug uh, the drug that you would choose i would choose would be adrenaline okay so that's how you work in ofcom cbg now post uh, similarly in uh, the post op cardiac surgery also now suppose if a patient comes with acute mi and presents with cardiogenic shock to you and you are called to see the patient either in the cath lab or in the cc or in the casualty you check the patient your systemic pressure is more than 90 but uh, lv function is low uh, periphery is a cold pressure is, uh, you you get the systemic pressure is 90 no output patient it looks to be in pulmonary edema which what would be a drug of choice milrinone dobutamine dobutamine or milrinone 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 would you add something to it along with it or not milrinone not adrenaline right. why because milrinone right. will cause vasodilatation so okay uh, to increase the svr we have okay. to add some noradrenaline okay so the drug of if your blood pressure is more than 90 in this scenario your drugs better the options that you have is either dobutamine or milrinone if you are using a stronger uh, dilator like a uh, milrinone then better to add it along with the noradrenaline now suppose if the blood pressure is less than 90 or let's say you go there your blood pressure is 70 patient is very restless would you do something pulmonary edema desaturating 80% saturation even on ma you are going on a reservoir bag 10 liters 12 liters 5 to 60% but saturations are falling down patient is uh, has chest full of crepitations systemic pressure 70 saturation is in the range of 80 85 what would you do intubate okay you have intubated then okay classic classic very good then adrenaline adrenaline okay. anything okay. else along with it so remember one thing that as per present studies i also present literature noradrenaline has is coming up in a very big way for as a primary drug or the first drug of choice in most patients of shock okay so always because the idea of treating shock is first is you improve the mean arterial pressure so you have to use them on adrenaline and noradrenaline combination obviously you have to intubate you give them that okay Okay. Suppose it's not improving with that, then what are you going to do? Shock patient, acute MI. You have intubated. You have given Lasix. Patient is on 100% oxygen. You have started noradrenaline. You have started adrenaline. Pressure is not improving. What are you going to do next? Class of pressure, sir. Balloon. Casualty. You can put. You can put IABP, sir. Patient is in casualty. So, what is the primary goal of therapy in patients with acute MI presenting with cardiogenic shock? What should be your first? What should be your major intervention? PCA, sir. Ah, yeah. So, always fi find the cause and treat the cause. So, the first goal should be to take up the patient for angiography and try to see if you can do a PCI or a PAMI along with that. And if patient patient is continuously on hemodynamic stable, unstable, put the patient on balloon pump. Balloon, sir. So, the idea of discussing this is. instead of using very high doses of inotropes and vasopressors it is always better to use them in moderate doses in combination and go for a higher intervention like in this case if you if you think that the patient is requiring more of noradrenaline add an adrenaline if you feel that patient is requiring higher dose of adrenaline noradrenaline take the patient up to cath lab and simultaneously pass in a balloon iabp so that should be the goal of therapy a patient comes to you with chronic heart failure acute decompensation what would be your drug of choice milrinone patient in the case of chronic heart failure milrinone is around 20 25% but now presents to you with pulmonary edema drug of choice milrinone why because it is uh, not affected by the uh, beta regulation down oh. so these patients will be will have down regulation of beta receptors so in these patients milrinone would be the drug of choice okay cardiac arrest we have already discussed suppose patient presents to you with vasoplegia vasopressin no no noradrenaline and vasopressin both can be used yes depending upon what is the cause and what is the thing you can use either or both the drugs patient presents to you with right ventricular myocardial infarction what are the combination of drugs that you are going to use right ventricular myocardial infarction milrinone noradrenaline 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 Because why noradrenaline? Because TVR. 
मिलरन ऑन बट यू एक्सपेक्ट द पीवीआर टू बी हाई इट्स राइट राइट वेंट्रिकुलर एमआई प्राइमरी आरवी प्रॉब्लम you don't expect the pvr to be high in this scenario isn't it because nothing if the rv is got infected nothing will be flowing into the pulmonary circulation to produce high pvr okay okay my answer is correct but milrinone the reason is studies have shown that rv function by further reducing the pvr and by producing good inotropism in patients with rv dysfunction whether it is primary or secondary primary meaning whether there is a problem with the right ventricle or secondary because of other causes like like as you said right the severe pulmonary artery hypertension in those cases or pulmonary thromboembolism in those cases also rv function is supposed to be better if you use a combination of milrinone along with a vasopressor but always remember in all patients with right ventricular problems the main idea should be to improve and keep the mean arterial pressure on the higher side always remember this golden rule that in all patients presenting to you with rv dysfunction whether it is primary rv problem or secondary rv problem secondary to some other cause the goal of management should be to maintain good perfusion pressure to maintain good mean or higher mean arterial pressure so noradrenaline always should be used in these patients to maintain good perfusion pressure along with using a use of milrinone in patients presenting to with bradyarrhythmias with uh, leading to hemodynamic instability drug of choice Sorry, isoprenaline. 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 This is one unique scenario in which isoprenaline would be the drug of choice. Bradyarrhythmia, or even in patients who are whose heart rate is low but who have severe pulmonary artery hypertension, even in RV MI, if you don't have milrinone with you, and if the heart rate is low, because many of these patients of RV MI will be in bradycardia, so in this scenario also isoprenaline also could be a good drug because it will improve your heart rate. it will improve your con rv contractility it will keep the pvr low so isoprenaline could also be used in a scenario of right ventricular myocardial infarction so we are clear with this clinical scenario any question anybody has in, on these clinical scenarios any doubts sir with the hemodynamic instability how can you use an uh, isoprenaline sir see this is your condition okay. more right so we are talking about hemodynamic instability related to the bradycardia not so much related to the other cause not cardiogenic shock okay so this bradycardia leading okay. to hemodynamic instability specific scenario okay so always remember now to conclude whenever you are using this drugs always remember that monitoring becomes the most important part when you are using any any of these drugs either in isolation or in combination so one has to know what are the normal hemodynamic values that exist in the body what are the normal hemodynamic values that you need to target and always monitor these patients by monitoring if the patient is on inotropes or vasopressors always best to monitor the ecg best to monitor the arterial pressures and try as much as possible to give these drugs through a central access in certain scenarios if some centers are based on center specific protocols if you are using swan gans catheter you can monitor cardiac output svr pvr all the various values calculate these values and then taper or or, or alter your therapy based on these values so we are already aware of these hemodynamic values so this is just a chart representing that now to conclude whenever we are faced with a scenario wherein we feel that these drugs are going to be used the first and the most important thing is to find the cause first to determine whether the patient is in shock or whether the patient is just in hemodynamic instability but not in shock and once you know once you have made the diagnosis that there is a, there is hemodynamic instability or patient is in shock you first find the cause of shock all of us know that may basically shock can be classified into three types cardiogenic shock where the cause is cardiac in origin hypovolemic shock where the shock is primarily because of hypovolemia and distributive shock now why it's important to know the cause for shock because the cause once you know the cause of shock your therapy will depend basically upon the type of or the cause of shock if it's cardiogenic you'll go for more of inotropes or inodilators if there is hypovolemic shock you use vasopressor along with volume if there is distributive shock now type what are the types of distributive shock distributive shock basically is a condition where the svr goes low so it can happen in neurogenic shock or spinal shock or post brain death septic shock anaphylactic shock or sometimes with syst a severe systemic inflammatory response syndrome these conditions will lead to massive fall in svr so when you measure the hemodynamic variations you will get a high cardiac output but low cvp low uh, low wedge pressures low cvp low svr so this will come under the classification of distributive shock and in these scenarios early intervention using vasopressors whether it is noradrenaline vasopressin 
and in certain rare conditions methylene blue can also be used for treatment of these patients of distributive shock now one point again i would like to mention here is certain patients like patients who are on long term angiotensin receptor uh, drugs like you know these especially heart failure patients these patients have a higher tendency to go into syst severe systemic inflammatory response syndrome post surgery like post heart transplant or post elvad surgery so in these patients early institution of vasopressor therapy is what is required hence one has to be very sure about before instituting therapy as to what is the cause for the hemodynamic instability and remember always that you have to use the lowest possible doses which support the perfusion and not the highest possible doses and combination therapy is always better remember that in presence of acidosis and hypoxia these these two factors they affect the receptor binding so in the, and especially for sympathomimetic agents like adrenaline noradrenaline so if there is persistent acidosis persistent hypoxia you have already used adrenaline noradrenaline dobutamine combinations or if patient is in refractory cardiogenic shock vasopressin should be selected as one of the drugs because acidosis and hypoxia do not act on vasopressin remember that desensitization and down regulation occurs in patients with chronic heart failure also in patients who are on prolonged therapy or long duration therapy with these inotropes and inodilators so in this group of agents phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitors like milrinone or levosimendan are could be good drugs of choice okay thank you any questions or any comments if anybody wants to add something or if there are any doubts feel free to ask any questions any doubts with regards to any of the drugs no questions any questions for dr gorov is dr rahul uh, still there no sir rahul sir is not online so if there are no questions i think we can close the session dr rahul yes sir, no questions sir from my side sir. So, you, sir, please close the session if it's over. Doctor Rahul, is there something to add, Dr. Bishwas? No, sir, he's on. He's not online. You can close. Ah, the okay, session. fine. Okay, fine. In that case, uh, thank you, Doctor Gaurav, for this presentation. Thank you. And uh, thank you to all the students who participated. And we close the session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir.